So I'm not going to I'm not going to try to speak Italian to them as much as I want to <laughs> because I only know my dad's Italian, which was more curse words than anything. So, but um, but really, we are so excited. If you don't know who they are, you should. So they literally, I was, as I've told my family, they literally wrote the book on Power BI. Uh, they have been involved with SQL BI, Bravo, Dax.do, Dax.guide. Uh, if you are trying to figure out and get a concept of Dax, how it works, how to apply it. Uh, pitfalls and really almost like this from the application to the theoretical you have to check out SQL BI if I'm working on a project I guarantee you I have 20 articles open from SQL BI at a time the one thing I recommend make the search a little better because I need I, I <laughs> because I rely on, on your guys website so these guys are absolutely incredible and obviously you guys here know this but um, yeah let's kind of dive in <coughs> just some ground rules for the ask me anything and we're done or at least I'm done. So, all right, so next slide. So quick ground rules for the Ask Me Anything. For those who are here, be courteous of time with your question. <coughs> We're focusing on DAX and data modeling. So if you're gonna ask them about Power Query, don't. Um, so, I mean, you can talk to Seth after, but uh, really tonight, the kind of the topics and anything that has to do with DAX, anything that has to do with data modeling. So just make a line and feel free to ask your question. They do have their computer, but I think the focus is really something that you've been clamoring to ask them. If you're online, you can also ask questions too. <clears throat> there is a link, I believe it will go on the YouTube chat, uh, poll EV, uh, there we go. <coughs> At the bottom there, Tom Pulia 913. You can ask questions there, and for those online, if you're getting bored, you can vote on the questions, and then we'll go that way. But just be courteous of time, focus on DAX and data modeling, um, and yeah, just be direct with the questions. With that, I want to give the floor to Marco and Alberto. Again, my absolute gratitude for you guys being here today um, to really kick off the user group. And let's dive in. So if you guys want to start with the questions, and poll EV is now open for those online. So one thing for the in-audience members, anybody who asks a question can come over and grab a piece of swag. And based on the number of people we have here, I Pretty sure we have enough swag for everybody, but first come, first serve gets the good stuff. So yeah, if you uh, for asking, if you can come up uh, to the microphone so that all of our online listeners can hear you, that would be fantastic. And Mike, did we have a? If you'd love to introduce yourself and your your name, that's all right. And then your good. question, that'd be great. Just keep going. Just keep going. Just keep going. Okay. Um, hi guys, my name's Eric. I'm from Cincinnati. Um, for the show, long time listener, first time caller. Um, I have just a general question about where Microsoft's positioning Power BI. It's a visualization engine in front of everything. It's uh, with Power uh, Pivot, uh, Power uh, Platform, Azure, uh, Synapse. Um, it's replacing uh, analysis services. I'm an old MDX guy. Are you happy about that? Do you like that? Do you see the direction it's going in being uh, something that you wanted? And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> we, start, we, we start with a simple question. <laughs> <laughs> it's a simple question. Uh, no, I mean, first of all, we are not from Microsoft, so I can provide you my point of view, which is probably not the Microsoft one, which is good because it's more fun. So. Um, First of all, I, I, I cannot reply, I cannot answer about what, Microsoft, what is the Microsoft direction, because probably I would, say, I would say something that is completely wrong. What I see is that they try to push Power BI everywhere, but they are, they are also trying to push uh, Synapse everywhere and all the other products everywhere. So because uh, at the end of the day, you should use a Microsoft product only. Now, Power BI, it's clearly a self-service BI tool, which, uh, in my personal opinion, is not the best data visualization tool. Actually, it's not even a very good one. But it, it has a wonderful ratio of you know, per cost performance, return of investment uh, for the visualization too. Because when you are in a company, you want to create repo level company, um, it does the job. Um, 
Could it be nicer? Yes. Could it be cooler? Yes. More modern? <laughs> yes. Faster? Yes. There are many, many things that could do. But is it be any better than of, of uh, other uh, previous tools from Microsoft? Yes. Uh, so the power of Power BI, in my opinion, are two elements. First, the semantic model. When I say semantic model, I mean the set of tools that allows you to create a model that is uh, available to many other clients. Even though, as, as of today, uh, there are very few clients that generate DAX code, and a larger number of clients that generate MDX code that can steal you um, Power BI models, not only Excel, Tableau, for example, or many other tools generate MDX code, which means that you have a very large ecosystem that can consume artifacts produced by Power BI. So from that point of view, I would say that I don't know other tools that are superior from this point of view in the market in general. Uh, the, the, the Microsoft is way ahead of the competitors for the competitor for, for many things, in particular for the, 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 the semantic model itself, so the ability to create complex relationships uh, and to use DAX to create complex calculations that can be reused. Nobody else has this. Uh, Power Query is a wonderful tool. It's not the best one for the performance, maybe, but in terms of usability for the Set service BI user is wonderful. Um, the ability to create composite models, nobody, nobody is even close to that feature. Okay, nobody is even close to that feature. And of course, we may always say, say we always say, oh, we will, we would like to do more. Fantastic. But now, go out and try to do something even just close to that. Is way ahead. So I, I think that Microsoft, in a way does not push enough on the, I mean, if I was in Microsoft, I would stress the word every day about these points of strength that they don't highlight enough, leaving to other vendors and also the community the ability to say, oh, we are reinventing the wheel. Guys, 30 or 40 years ago, there was a tool called Business Objects, which is the first tool I used in my experience in the, in the business intelligence which basically had a semantic model generating SQL code. Simply doesn't work. There are limitations in the way you can express a calculation in SQL that cannot scale on a complex model. Full stop. The story says that. And until someone demonstrated that there is a way to avoid using another language to solve this problem, I think that we need another language. We try with MDX, we try, we're trying now with DAX, other vendors use other tools, like Click has another language to do that. But the, the common path is that if you need to express a calculation so that it can be applied on every report using relationships, you cannot just use SQL. This is, the sto this is not my opinion. This is what the story demonstrated so far in many years. When I will read something that someone or some company that says, oh, we have a new idea, a big idea, but when I see tools that are just reinventing the wheel, I usually am bored after maybe 15 seconds and I close and I don't read. Because when I see what they are doing, they are just creating an, just another SQL engine, just another SQL generator engine that will face the very same limitations that we have seen in business objects so many years ago. I will be happy to be demonstrative of the contrary. Oh, no, Marco, you're wrong. Now we're doing this that can do that. Oh, nice. And unfortunately, I see, and I will never mention the name, I see people who are experienced people also working in Microsoft, also working in databases with a lot of history that don't understand why DAX is needed. Guys, there is a problem in the communication, in my opinion, because not, not because I'm, I'm teaching DAX, but because actually <laughs> it's uh, also MDX is good. And, and the need for another language, we can invent another language, but my opinion is that SQL is not enough. So that is the part of this. 
I would say, is powerful in the Power BI uh, ecosystem. When you have to provide this to a search for BI user, you usually start saying data visualization because it's an easier uh, thing to sell. And from that point of view, we still have some weakness that, however, I think Microsoft will we try to solve in the next few years. I think yeah, you've been extremely polite. <laughs> I mean, you, you only said good things, so we can also say something that is not that we don't like. I mean, job. yeah. <laughs> so we do the good and the backup. That's fine. Yeah. No, I think because you also asked if we are happy with that, and I think Microsoft somewhat forgot about developers. Microsoft pushes Power BI as a self-service BI tool, and that is absolutely fine. There are a lot of self-service BI users, uh, and they are developing a lot of uh, interesting things. But uh, when it comes to developers, uh, we do need something different. We do need powerful editors. We do need source control. We do need a lot of features which are not there. Or multi-developers, multiple developers working together on the same project. That's something that you don't worry about if you only target self-service BI users because there's typically one guy working on a model. But in the corporate environment, that's pretty normal to have multiple people working on the same model, and that is not supported at all. Visual Studio is uh, embarrassing. Let's not talk about how Visual Studio works. So to me, what is missing, pieces that are missing are mainly tools for developers in order to speed up development and in order to work in a better way. Then I do agree. From the modeling point of view, Power BI is probably the best tool that is available because of the semantic model, uh, which is not promoted, in my opinion, as it should. But that's exactly what you say. So I think Power BI would be better if, if there were better development tools. Of course, you can use third-party tools. I'm not saying that there are no tools uh, for that, but Microsoft should propose something uh, better, just include it in, uh, in uh, the offering. Agreed. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Way to summarize. Patrick from Chicago. Um, so um, DAX do, DAX patterns, DAX Guide uh, have been an essential part of my movement through the learning curve, which is extremely steep um, and long for um, Power BI, but they've been fantastic, so thank you for that. Um, my question for you is with regard to uh, calculation groups. Uh, so a very powerful component uh, within Power BI, I think relatively newly added, uh, recently added to Power BI. And you, you have examples on your website of uh, different techniques that can be used to uh, take advantage of that. Um, but do you see um, a further evolution of the uh, examples that are available and the applications of calculation groups um, in your uh, website or training yeah. materials? <clears throat> can I? You want to go ahead? We can talk about tax patterns. Uh, yeah. Okay. Then we need to do that. That's a problem. No, but we already. That's fine. Okay. We already. So. Um, <laughs> now that's the marketing part. Then I tell you the status that is important. But go ahead. I do the marketing. You do. You the do the marketing. marketing. I tell them the truth. <laughs> ah, okay, that's fine. That's fine. We can do that. Okay, I agree. So uh, we. So first of all, um, after an initial, I don't do a marketing part now. Let me start okay. With, I know. After initial enthusiasm about calculation groups, uh, we discovered that calculation groups are an unfinished feature from Microsoft for two problems. One, uh, they don't have a default member selection, which seems a small problem. It is a huge problem. The second problem of the calculation groups is the performance. The performance of calculation groups can be improved a lot in a number of scenarios that will extend the usability of calculation groups in many areas where we today don't even think about what we could do. I mean, we try, but we know that it doesn't make sense to even show what we could do because it would be too slow. 
Once these two, uh, these two problems are fixed, and please note, I didn't mention the lack of an editor. Once these two problems are fixed, it's possible to generate much more uh, patterns that can be applied to the calculation, using the calculation groups. As of today, what we could do, and what we will do, is to uh, extend, I, I don't provide a date, but uh, it's, uh, it is to provide for those patterns where this could be could make sense to, to provide a, a version of the pattern with the calculation groups. And maybe to provide some tool that make it easier to adopt this calculation group in your model, for example. That could be something where, where we can do some something useful, right? Um, but the limitation of the calculation group, in my opinion, is that calculation groups are not the solution for the time intelligence problem. And calculation groups are not the right solution for not problems where the performance, sorry, where the presence of multiple calculation items that should be driven by the result of another selection, not the manual selection of the user, is a performance issue today that is big. And the ability to have a default member that you define in the model will allow to create calculation groups that intercept all the measures that opens the possibility of creating debugging framework or other kind of application that today is, are not possible. Because you, you don't have a way to intercept all the measures in a model. A calculation group with a default member could do. And that would be very, very powerful. So we, when those two problems are solved, there are much number uh, of things that we can do. Uh, there is a last, and then I, the <laughs> last problem is the consumption experience of the calculation group. It should be improved a lot. Microsoft is working on that, and now, for example, the format, the formatting, the formatting, dynamic formatting uh, problem has been partially solved. Even though still uh, many custom visuals still don't implement the, 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 the dynamic format for the calculation groups. Um, so, well, there, there are many things that you can do today with the calculation groups, but we are still not, uh, I mean, uh, from my point of view, it's not feature complete. That's the problem. Right? And this is a limitation. And I need to do the bad cop, of course. Yep. Like, it's even worse than that. <laughs> Meaning that, even though we started with calculation group with a lot of enthusiasm because it was cool, a new feature, we can do a lot of things, uh, and then we started using them. There are scenarios where they totally make sense. Uh, nonetheless, as soon as you start building more complex calculation groups, or you just have two or three calculation groups in the same model, the problem of defining the precedence, uh, the problem of recursion, the problem of uh, measures created by the user that set a calculation group and prevent your internal calculation group to, to work, uh, they are serious problems. Uh, you can create a calculation group uh, and users by writing measures in a fancy way, but you know users will do that, of course, as the first calculation they do. They, they might stop make uh, your measure stop working because they set a calculation group from the outside and that creates a problem with the detection of, uh, secret, of uh, recursion. So the level of complexity of calculation group is really high, much higher than I think any other feature in uh, our index. Maybe composite models uh, prove to be a bit more, a cha more of a challenge. But all these features that are promoted as very simple, very easy, everybody can use them, they are actually hard. You need to spend time learning, you need to spend a lot of time debugging and checking how the code works. So yes, we will implement the DAX patterns with calculation groups. Some are really nice, some are just Good to see, but there is nothing special. In some scenario, calculation groups are totally useless. Uh, so we will improve them a bit. Uh, Microsoft can improve the usability by adding the feature that Marco was speaking about, but still the complexity is there. And whenever I talk about calculation groups and I teach it to users, I always say spend weeks, if not months, uh, just working with them and gaining experience. Because otherwise, uh, that the chances of making mistakes are really, really high. That's the reason why, yes, I love calculation groups. I use them as a feature sometimes. Uh, I don't think they are the holy grail of uh, uh, DAX because they are not. 
time intelligence. We start, everybody thinks about time intelligence. Hey, we can do time intelligence calculation with calculation groups. But at the end, it's, uh, you don't get a lot of advantages because if you just wanted a matrix to have the year to date and the sales amount and the quarter to date of two different measures, uh, you cannot with Power BI because of limitation of the, from the editor level, because you should not create measures to set the calculation group. So there are a lot of small details that prevent it from being usable. It's a half-baked for sure, but even when it will be full-baked, uh, still there are some details that are dangerous. That's unfortunately DAX. It looks very easy, it looks very simple, everybody loves it at first sight, uh, but then you need to slow down and learn it the right way. You cannot work in marketing. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> That's the reason you are here. You do the marketing, I'll do the bad guy. I'm trying to sell the training. You need to come to the training. To finish it. No, that doesn't work. Yeah, but, but it's a trial. Elizabeth, I'm from Chicago as well. Um, I have a follow-up question about calculation groups. Um, recently, I'm developing right now a Power BI report, and I'm kind of hoping to allow end users to choose whether they want to view everything, you know, everything in my dashboard by revenue or by a transaction count. And so, we're looking to potentially leverage calculation groups specifically for the dynamic string formatting. Is that an area of calculation groups that you feel is performing optimally now that Microsoft has allowed those calculation groups to actually display the correct values in the visuals um, and no longer just display as text? Or is that an area that we should maybe try to find a different solution? So one of the problems that we had with the dynamic form of string was the presence of the um, Visualizations that don't support that thing, but now that problem should be, should have been fixed. There is another thing that uh, could pro create problem performance issues, which is the fact that when you use the dynamic form of string, I think still in the current version of Power BI, you will see a number of additional measures that are generated to uh, generate the form of string. And what happens if you if you look at the at the DAX code generated for populating the, the visuals, you will see that the, your measures are doubled by you, you see the measure for example says amount and then says amount form a string and, and so on. So you have ten measures in the visual, you have twenty measures to compute, which raises the problem of the complexity of the calculation for the form a string, but also the the size the volume of data that the, the client receives to, to, to manage that. I know because we use the tabular object model for a number of tools. So when there is a new feature in the tabular object model, we know in advance without breaking any NDA, we know in advance that there is something happening. And something that is going to happen is the ability to have the, the former string as a dynamic property of the measure. Once this is implemented properly, I expect that the DAX code should not generate additional requests in DAX, and there could be a greater efficiency of the system. But this is my speculation. I don't have any information to say how this yeah. will improve. That's exactly what I'm wondering. How can they improve that? There could be some optimization in the way the, the code is executed and the way the, the, the result is returned. For example, you might, I mean, it's a, it's a long discussion, but. Let's go on. So Sorry. what I'm saying is that there, there, there could be some advantage uh, by, by this evolution, uh, which could solve, could help in solving the performance issues that I know a few customers suffered by using the dynamic form of string. It worked, but it was too slow for a few reports that where they have, they have a lot of measures. Okay. If you have a small number of measures, usually it's not a big deal, but with a larger number of measures, many of them are not even visible, but for example, used for other purposes like the, know, the, the, the dynamic, um, uh, not the dynamic, ah. when you highlight the color of the cell, the, the dynamic conditional formatting, conditional formatting. Okay. Conditional formatting 
Uh, that, yeah, th there are cases where there could be an advantage. I, I don't know. Uh, we, we have to wait and see. At the moment, it, it improved a lot, however, because at least we have a number of visuals that you can use with a, with a dynamic former string. So it should work. Cool. OK, good. Great. Be sure to grab some. <laughs> next question. Who's next? I'm Sandeep from Chicago. So Hello. first, a uh, tough question. Have you tried Chicago pizza and did you like it? <laughs> yes. And the second That's question, easy. good. Um, and second question, so on your website, and you've done, Alberto, you've done a video as well on um, using streaming data sets with import and then as an alternative to direct query. Have you used that with any of your clients? Has How has it worked? Um, any experiences you can share, especially as in comparison to direct query? So, okay, so let me address this first. The pizza. <laughs> that was the important question. Yeah. Okay, I can so, answer that. You go uh, ahead with the rest. Okay. It's great. It's a pizza, but it's good. Pizza. Absolutely cool. Is, is there a particular restaurant that you've been to that you say you would like, that first, you've gone is to? is it pizza? Well, Tommy has a big thing with pizza. He doesn't like the deep dish here. He says it's not real pizza. It's good. It's just not pizza. It's good. I'm no, absolutely. It's I told the delivery. Pizza. It's not a pizza. <laughs> it's a pizza. <laughs> but it's very good. I like it. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a very good dish. Yeah. Just don't call it pizza. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm scared. I mean, uh, Chicago style pizza yeah. with, uh, how do you say, ananas? Pineapple. Pineapple. You don't do that, oh. right? <laughs> No, you no, don't. No, no, no. no, no. That's another Italian variety hour. So, <laughs> uh, in, in Italy, in Italy, it's it's not illegal. It's immoral to put pineapple <laughs> on that. So, no, yeah. If you ask that, in many places they refuse to serve it. I'm not joking. Yeah. That that is the no, Actually, they kick you out. Immediately. <laughs> <laughs> no, but. Now, talking about the <laughs> data sets. Standards. <laughs> so, the, first of all, I don't think that the, 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 the push data set is not a replacement for that query, but is a, um, an option that I will consider if you have a requirement that would otherwise force you to implement that query for the entire model, right? That query is simply slow and introduces a number of limitations that reflect in bad performance when not in other problems of you don't obtain the right result for complex models, okay? Um, and discussing about that, that, that is another question. So, so let's say that you have the need of, oh, we need a, uh, dashboard with the real time information about how much the sales are going for the website. How many vi how many website how many visits on the website we have? How many tweets? How many likes? Something like that. Which means that we're not talking about the profit and loss report that a public company has to report to the New York Stock Exchange, right? It's something that if there is an error. Come on, we can leave. Tomorrow, tomorrow morning, we have the real data. If we have a small mistake today, nobody really cares. Okay, if we have this condition, we can say, okay, wait a minute. If I get data I prepared yesterday, which are perfect, and I get a subset of this data that can stay in memory in a small model, and I introduce the transactions I can detect today, every second, I can create a dashboard with a few tiles that are updated in real time. So you basically open the, uh, the website or the page or the report, and you see the numbers changing. And this makes people happy. And this is also another problem. You don't have to implement that query. So people are happy, no their query, win-win. This is my point of view. The cost for this implementation is uh, minimal, even though it requires some coding skill. So there is a price to pay. It's not free. 
Uh, you need someone that can actually write C-sharp code or maybe Python or maybe a PowerShell scripts, something like that. Um, but it just works. And the other problem, not the only problem, is that it's free. So you will never see much advertising about this feature because it's actually free. So nobody is really interested in pushing this feature. It doesn't require premium. You, you can use Power BI uh, Pro and it just works. The only problem with Power BI Pro, you have the problem of how do you populate the initial data? So because the idea behind the, 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 the article we have is that we, uh, every day, we reset the situation, we, call, we get the historical data to create a baseline because this way you can show the trend uh, year over year or something like that in real time. But then we use this as a baseline to get the data populated during the day. Um, if we have a Power BI Pro, how do I query the existing model populating this initial data set? The current implementation um, uses uh, an XMLA endpoint, which has a, a restriction. It, we should improve the library, introducing the ability to use the uh, Power BI API that can be used over a Power BI Pro report, I think. It should be possible. But there, then there is a limitation of the 100,000 rows, which creates a limitation that otherwise we will not have because the limit would be 1 million rows. So there is some trade-off to evaluate. But at the moment, it is not implemented. I, don't, I know that there are a few companies that started to implement such a project, not, not a big number, but we use it. I mean, internally, we use it every day. I, I have a lot of data with that technique. It's good. It works. Welcome. I can ask another question. Hey, go ahead. We're going to do one from online. Uh, real do quick. we have yeah. something online? Yeah. Yeah. So we got a, a lot of people on. A, ah, okay. Yeah. So. Uh, Say it loud. Yeah. Uh, so what makes a model? This is the top vote. So take it as you will. But what makes a model eloquent or subject subjectively good in your eyes? I guess maybe the other way to phrase that is, can a model be subjectively good, not necessarily? How would you define uh, a good model? How would you define a good model? In your eyes. I think it's, it's very simple. It's a star schema, then it's good. We'll if it's that. not a star schema, then... Yeah. I, I, I think we have to clarify. It's challenging. When, when we say that it, it has to be a star schema, it doesn't mean that it has to be one fact table only. No, there it could be multiple their schemas which share dimensions and it is good. Which means that when you look at the diagram, you might see a lot of tables. But then if you are able to create one page for each fact table with just a star schema, that's perfect. So I, I gotta be honest though. I mean from the most voted question. I mean that's that's what I deal with every day. I get we, we get given models all the time. Just snowflaking everywhere <laughs> it's so bad I know, I know. and they're like it won't work i can't make the dax work i'm like yeah your model's junk we got to start <laughs> upstream and we got to fix it so like i i totally understand that point and it makes it so much easier yeah, to work yeah, with because you go from single table models yeah there are still a lot of people that do believe that a single table makes sense it does not there's no reason to make to create a single table mm -hmm. or like a hundred tables which are connected through a chain of relationship that it makes it impossible to follow what happens. Uh, yeah. I place a filter here and I have no idea what is happening. Uh, then you put just uh, a couple of spicy bidirectional cross filter relationship and that's that. Yeah. You created a monster. So the good old data modeling is, is still there. Build a star schema and that just works. But that is, in my opinion, one of the one other feature that Power BI is completely missing, that is uh, an evaluation of the quality of your model. Why shouldn't Power BI tell me, hey, yeah, your model is fine. It's a star schema. Everything is working nicely. Or the relationship you built are not really cool. You might improve them in some way. Mm -hmm. So I think among the many, many features that Microsoft creates, uh, pushing a bit more on the data modeling part, that would be very welcome because that would 
drive users uh, just to ask themselves, what is a star schema? Is it the right choice? Should I add a table or not? Or even something very, very simple, like coloring the tables in the diagram view, saying, hey, yellow is a dimension and blue is a fact table. That would be, that would be That'd absolutely be really useful. Yeah. Ideas.powerbi.com. <laughs> <laughs> Is there an opportunity for, is there not? I'll ask my question. <laughs> <laughs> I have a problem question. Sorry. Maybe. Nice. Yeah. Okay. yeah, go ahead. Um, so evaluate and log. What are your thoughts on that? Um, so when it came out, definitely a lot of buzz around that and how it's going to help the developers. Um, tried it haven't really found a use case where it will really help, maybe because of the limitations that we have currently that you have to use a tracing and then get the results and use it. Is it something that can be implemented in DAX Studio? Um, and how will it help the developers write quality DAX or understand DAX? Um, any thoughts on that? Uh, Do we just need bad cop so, on this one? Just bad cop? No. <laughs> we need to find a good I, cop. I, I have to find a, a good way to. So, evaluate and log shows how the engine works internally, which is far, very far from how you conceptually want to represent the DAX expression. Because, for example, if there is an optimization made by the engine, you will see the result of the optimization, which could be far from what you wrote. As long as you try a simple expression, you can see something that you can understand. As, uh, as soon as you start creating a complex expression, we, which is where you're supposed to find it useful, the first issue is that you see a number of intermediate artifacts that are not what you asked for, but they are used internally for the calculation. So I find that information extremely useful. I don't think that a user that doesn't have a very deep knowledge about not just DAX, but about how the formula engine works and how the storage engine works and how they communicate together. Without this deep knowledge, I don't understand where you are helping the random DAX user that doesn't use DAX often. Yeah, it basically provides a lot of information, but if you know how to read and how to understand those information, you basically don't need them because you can already understand what is happening just by looking at the code. So if you're a casual DAX user, that is not going to help. And I think, I don't want to be too polemic about that, but there are so many other small details they could spend their time on. Uh, if they want to help, uh, community and debuggers and developers uh, improving the way that the query plan and the server timings and all the information that are provided and that DAX Studio already reads. Uh, but where we don't have enough information to build uh, a graphical representation of the query plan uh, or uh, better information about what is happening or a shortened version of the query plan or knowing where data caches are being consumed in the query plan, those are information that would greatly help uh, uh, the community to build then uh, better tools. So working there, that would be great. Uh, evaluate and log to me just looks like something that, yeah, it was there, we push it out, and then we it, promote it with articles uh, claiming that it helps users to learn DAX, uh, but I think they could have done it better. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an intermediate step, so if you in a dot, I don't know how much distant future, that feature is useful in a particular area. 
but today I don't see how it can help users. I, 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 I have a difficult time trying to explain how this helps. Because when you look at the result and you see something that is different from what you are asking, I, I, had the, I know exactly how to, how to explain that. But here's the problem. I have to explain it. So we are back to the initial problem. So um, I think there is another issue, which is that you have to modify the code to use it. Yes. And hopefully you don't forget to take it out before you use it. <laughs> That's yeah, because a then detail. this also That's a lot a of optimization. Yeah. So um, I don't know. I mean, this feature five years ago would have been useful. Today we have a product, Tabular 803, which has a full debugger, which is great. It's wonderful. And so now we have a terms of comparison. Five years ago, without the terms of comparison, great. Today, why should I use it? Oh, this is free, and the other is a commercial product. OK, but I'm a professional developer. If I'm a professional developer, and I don't have Tabular 803, I seriously question how I evaluate my time. Because the time I can save using Tabular 8 or 3 is so large, it's easy to justify the cost. Easy. So if you are not using Tabular 8 or 3, I say, OK, you, you don't, you're, if, you don't, if you cannot justify that, that product, it means that you work less than one hour per month on Power BI work writing DAX code. That's an explanation. Or um, for some strange reason, you cannot adopt in the company. There are companies that say, no, we cannot use uh, third-party products. OK, sorry. Uh, I wrote an article about that, explaining, trying to explain, you company decide intentionally to not use other third-party tools. Fine, you are applying a tax to your development. It's your decision. You can blame Microsoft for that, but then you have to explain why you enter another door in the same floor where your developers are working, and they work with a lot of open source tools, and nobody say anything. Mm. What the? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> no problem. I didn't understand. This is what happens with Marco. Evaluate and log was the question. Yep. Evaluate and log. I know, but I... sorry. Hi, uh, Hi, Molly Miller from Wisconsin. So the question you just answered, as I stood up here, you might have answered my question. But um, the, so the context that I have is I'm more on the business side. We have a BI team that's de developing reports. Um, and I'm curious about when, when you run into a DAX statement that you know is wrong and you're, you're churning on it, and you're churning on it, and you're churning on it. And we have a particular one that's, you know, we know the context is wrong, right? What are the steps that you would take to, like, dig in and investigate? What are the first ways that you, what are the first areas you start to look at? And then, I guess I'm curious, like, yeah, like, how do you investigate a problem? That's my question. <laughs> OK. Ah, that's, a... that's an interesting question. <laughs> well, first of all, it, it strongly depends on the problem. Yeah. Let's say the problem is a measure that doesn't compute the correct value for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Well, and again, that depends on how complex that measure is. Yeah. But let me tell you, the. To me, the most important thing, whenever it's time to debug some code or check a problem, is to stop working in production, stop working with real data, build a very simple model on top of which you can predict the outcome very quickly. Like with this set of filters, the result need to be two. My measure computes one, and I can understand why it computed one. Most of the scenarios that I see, users are saying, hey, my numbers are not correct. I say, OK, what number do you expect? I don't know. I know it's not correct. Yeah. Hey, OK, yeah. so how am I expected to know if I fix the problem? If I don't know that the, my measure actually computes the right value. Mm -hmm. 
So whenever it's time to either develop some code that is complex or fix problems, uh, the first step is to spend like half an hour building a repro, a very simple model, like three tables, uh, a couple of relationships, uh, four rows, uh, and say, okay, now we can play with the code and understand yep. the logic. Once you have it, then it's a matter of understanding the code and fixing all the, all the details uh, sure. the right way. So you go on investigating. But to be the biggest enemy of debugging and developing is people working on the real model with millions of numbers that are impossible to, to understand. Mm -hmm. and indeed, I typically answer. Uh, the, the reason I sometimes uh, record videos where I answer to, to questions because I receive a file that is very simple with just uh, the code, a couple of tables. Uh, this is the number that I'm computing. I know it's wrong because the number should be the other value for these reasons. So I can say, well, that's easy. All, what, all what I need to add is my knowledge about DAX. I don't need to spend time understanding the business rules and uh, uh, the names of your columns and uh, all the complex stuff that makes me waste a lot of time. Yeah, thank you. Then that is, is phase your code. If the code is somebody else's, so the first step is seek for that guy, start beating him, and then <laughs> fix the code later. Well, thank you. You're welcome. I'm actually going to combine two questions from online, and it kind of goes off what you guys, what, uh, you were talking about Alberto. Uh, basically, how long, or do you guys often take the same approach to DAX problems? Um, so these are basically like, or do you guys have different methodologies to debug DAX code? The two of you. The two of you. Do you got, if you got, and someone else asked, do you, how long does it take you guys to agree yeah. on a concept? <laughs> Um, I mean, that's these, these, are, these, are the, these are two different questions because yeah. the way you can fix no, no, me, go ahead. the way we debug uh, a DAX issue, I think, is pretty similar. We uh, first of all we take a look at a model in Power BI. Usually, it's a Power BI repro, right? You, you look at that. If we identify the the problem, so let's say that there are two issues usually: performance issue or calculation issue. But in both cases, we try to isolate the problem, reduce the problem to a single measure, to a single visual, extract the query, go in DAX Studio. Because the, the <laughs> first thing we do, as soon as possible, move everything to DAX Studio because it's easier to, to, to make tests, to do analysis, to do everything for both performance and calculation. Once we're there, then we start to comment part of the code, the change part, the look at the number, having, if you have a reference of the number you expect, you start to do that. And I think that the approach is very similar. Yeah, that's very close. Uh, and that, I think, is a part of the question. The yeah. other question How, is... That, the other is much more interesting. Yeah, yeah, How yeah. long do we, does it take for us to agree on anything? Yeah, that's a long process. That's a long <laughs> process. <laughs> because, yeah. We basically disagree on everything, kind of. But we discuss a lot. We spend a lot of time discussing every single small detail of whatever. And we do have a complete different vision on uh, mostly everything. So it takes a lot of time. But what I know is that if I want an answer from Marco, if I find any kind of DAX problem that is a bit fancy or a piece of code that does not compute the right value or that is low, I know that Marco might be busy doing something like writing a book, and if I want to waste a day of him, it's just a matter of, hey, hey, if this code doesn't work as expected, and I know that 10 minutes later he will be there typing or doing something. No, no, no. the best or way... The, the best is, the best. this is the best version of my measure, can you make it faster? <laughs> that is gonna But there is another days. thing that has a higher priority, Marco, this, I don't understand why this doesn't work. This is highest priority. If you don't understand something yeah, and you ask cool. me, I, this is... But then you can score a point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But what I can tell you, at the end, what happens, and that's the reason why we work so well together, yeah. is that it doesn't really matter. We always agree on something because we're always open to change our mind. So even though I might strongly believe in something, uh, 
we fight, uh, we, we really fight hard. I remember, the, you remember the first videos that we recorded with the team, uh, the cameraman and uh, all the people? At the beginning of each individual clip, there was a, such a strong fight between us. Uh, like, you should not say that. No, this is not the right demo. Oh, no, you, didn't, you did it wrong. And they were scared. Like, we will never be able to finish the video because these guys are spending their time fighting. No, it's part of the process, don't worry. <laughs> and then a few minutes later, oh, yes, uh, ciao, friends. Uh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> we were explaining all our stuff uh, very politely. But because we agreed at the end. So after a very strong fight, either one or the other one is right. Me. <laughs> uh, last quick follow-up to that. If you were to both get a complicated model, work on it separately, how close would your final formula code be to each other? Same model, same, uh, same problem. Would you have, how similar would that DAX code be at the end of the Pretty much yes, but there is a difference in the coding style. So DAX for matter is the way we avoid having a discussion about how where to put the comma or where to put the space. We made a decision. We had DAX for matter done. So now yeah, that is for the formatting. But when it comes to writing code, uh, I don't think we write code in a similar way. I use more variables. I think I can you. tell if a measure has been written by you or by me. Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. Yeah. I, I if it's nice, it's mine. <laughs> no, 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 no. You, you have, no, no, no. My code is much better. Come on. It's not even a competition. Come on. Hi. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, Josh from Wisconsin. Um, Hi. There, there are a set of features in Power BI like um, anomaly detection and natural language measure creation, and I think Q&A is the other one they call it, um, that we haven't really had much luck with on our team. We find them more trouble than they're worth. Are we missing out, or, or do you think that those features have a ways to go before they can really get a lot of heavy use in different organizations? I think you're fine. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are features that are, um, what can we say? Polite. Um, okay. You need to be polite. Okay. So there are features that are requested by the media, by the journalists, by the analysts, by Gardner, by, you know, features that are buzzwords that are important to be in the product. Because otherwise, another product, another vendor has the feature, the feature X and we don't, and so this is a problem. So sometimes there is a feature that has to be there just because otherwise it could be a weak point in the comparison in the matrix Comparison metrics with other products. Is it, it use, is it useful and used? Uh, I don't know. Um, I would say that if, if we enter into the specific discussion of a few of those features that you mentioned, uh, I think that the, the Q&A could be good if you invest a lot of time. Um, out of the box, Without additional information and additional metadata, mm. maybe not much. Because it's not easy to be um, accurate. The issue, why do we use a BI system? Why do we use a pivot table? Why do we use measure? Why do we use a database? Because we want right numbers. So. Correct. We want to be predictable. We, we want to be able to explain the number. We want to be able to get the right number. Without going too deep in a few other discussion, I will uh, say something about something else, and you can cross the dots. Sure. The, we, are, we live in, a, in an amazing time. The artificial intelligence applied to the generation of Pictures, music, voice is simply wonderful. You can measure advances almost day by day, for sure week by week. Week by week, you see, oh, this is a new version. It's amazing that you see one, one week over another, you see incredible advances. Advancement. 
these algorithms are great. They do something that I didn't think it was possible to do in 2022. When you look at the picture, and you zoom the picture, you see errors. But we don't look at the picture so close, so we look at the picture at this distance, we don't care, it's fine. And by the way, it could be a way of art, right? The, the art is the error. The error is the part of the art. Fine. We can live with that. When we need predictability, the right number, precision, we don't tolerate errors. And this can be a problem because as of today, this direction that the algorithm and the neural network have don't have space to fix the issue that we are discussing now. We are very far in the direction they are going, they don't care. So you can do the math. So when you apply these technologies to our world, there is something they can do well. Choose the colors for my report. I look forward to get improved the, improve the, the design of my report. Fantastic. The numbers, please don't mess around with my numbers. <laughs> Even because if you think about that, the, the hardest part of writing a measure is understanding what the user wants. I don't know about your experience, but mostly the user says, I want this number. And then you start asking, OK, and what in this scenario? And what if the filter is that? And what happens if the data? So it's an iterative process that takes a, long, a lot of time. Thinking about passing this information through Q&A to a computer, that doesn't work. It's an iterative process. Or that an AI system can understand the requirement of a user and generate code that works and works in every scenario. That's not something that I believe is possible. No, Besides, it might work. I mean, in a simple star schema, the subjectively good model, it might generate some calculation that makes sense. But as soon as the model is a bit more complex with many to many relationships or with more complex scenarios, uh, it's still too hard to, to understand the requirements and implement them in the right way. I don't think AI systems are still ready for do, to do that. We, we are very far from an algorithm that can do that. that that's uh, the problem. I mean, I, I investigated on, the, on other areas, and I, I am amazed about what they are doing, but the direction where they are going now is not solving our problems. It's solving other problems that are very fun and interesting. Yeah. By the Saying, way. wow, I want this product. That's yeah. perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. The idea of Power BI Premium as the best of the tabular world. What do you think are the gaps between, or if any, between Power BI Premium and SSAS or AAS? I think that for a SQL Server analysis, the main difference is the price. Depending on the feature that you need, you might find that it is more convenient to go premium or Azure Analysis Services or SQL Server Analysis Services. It's complex, but when you have a large model, you don't necessarily want to go to premium, for example. Large means hundreds of gigabytes for a single database. Okay, this is my definition of large. Large model, you have hundreds, plural, of gigabytes for a single model, Premium could be way more expensive than all the other solutions without providing a real benefit. So the ratio could be very, very, very bad. Uh, below that, it depends. We have to look at other elements, other parameters, and there are still customers that find it, it's better to use SQL Server Analysis Services, maybe because they invested a lot of money before, and so they don't pay the hardware, so, and they already have the license, so they spend less if they continue to do what they have. Azure Analysis Services could be more convenient because you can stop it. Think about this. You pay Power BI Premium 24-7. You can pay Azure Analysis Services just the time you want. A customer asked me, we want to save money. 
we, we have budget cut. We have to save money. I said, you have Azure Analysis Service, right? Yes. The service can run Monday to Friday, 9 to, to 5. Oh, the manager said no. Say the manager that they, they have the money. If they really need to save money, they can do that. Or you can say, if I wake up at 10 p.m. and I want to see a report, I have to be able to do that. Okay, let's give them a button. They have to wait three minutes, and then they can do the query. Oh, no, three minutes is too much. So you have the money. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if, if you think that you cannot wait three minutes when you are the only user in the world using that report, then you have the money. Mm -hmm. That's my answer. And you have nothing better to do at 10 p.m. than look at that report. Just go there to are sleep. different time zones, you know. So. No, but I mean, Azure Analysis Services. So when I say there are different um, uh, features, because then uh, also Power BI Premium now has features that you don't have in uh, newer Azure Analysis Services, especially looking at the upcoming features, there will be much difference. But the difference in the, in the cost is still there. So it depends, right? I think that there is still space. Of course, Microsoft is interested in pushing premium for obvious reasons, but uh, as long as we have a choice, we can still make a choice. And there are cases where you might want to make another choice. If you can afford premium, okay, fine. Especially if you can use premium also for the other features that you have, not only the semantic model, well, it's a good value proposition. For example, we no longer have Azure Analysis Services now. We, we only use uh, Power BI Premium per user. We saved a lot of money. Yep. It's wonderful. I am uh, Donald from Nebraska. Uh, speaking of good and bad models, I've seen a lot of bad models because they could use bidirectional filters, like in header detail models yeah, yeah. to connect things. Should maybe that have been a feature that should be really, really optional, or maybe should just go away. The bidirectional filter. The bidirectional filter. Yes. Oh, they... No, I mean it's a feature. It's there. It makes sense to have it because there are scenarios, there are models, there are uh, there are models where bidirectional cross filter makes a lot of sense. Right. The biggest problem is that. Most people, most developers are not aware of the price of bidirectional cross filters in terms of speed, because crossing the relationship many to one is uh, way more expensive, several orders of magnitude more expensive than doing the, the other way around. Right. So it's expensive, and this is definitely not uh, clear. It's not evident in the model. And then it creates an ambiguous model. So you can obtain a model that is ambiguous, uh, therefore it starts computing crazy numbers. Uh, and Power BI doesn't tell you anything about that. It just shows you uh, when you create a bidirectional cross filter or many-to-many -many relationships or strange no, relationships. No, many-to-many you have a warning. For the many-to-many. -many, but you read that. I do, I do that all the time whenever I teach. I say, now take a look at this uh, the, warning. Well, it says uh, something like, uh, if you are aware that uh, the behavior will be different, you can move ahead. You say, what? <laughs> Indeed, you had to stop. You had to stop. The, 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 no, the... I mean, you see a yellow warning and an OK button. What do you do? Ask. <laughs> you click on OK, say, I'll go ahead, and let's see what happens. Yeah, it's, like... <laughs> it's not red, it's yellow. So you can go ahead. All right. That's the Italian light. Gotcha. So bidirectional cross filter is a powerful feature. Uh, it's not clear how powerful it is uh, and how dangerous it is. Uh, so to me, it makes sense to have it in the model. It should be a bit harder to enable. And basically, that's it. Keep in mind, at the very beginning, when bidirectional cross filter was uh, introduced in Power BI, it was the default. Uh, so oh, you just created the relationship, and by default, it was bidirectional. Uh, we just yeah. pray them, no, don't do that. Uh, this is going to be totally wrong. Right. It took them a few months uh, to go back they, and revert they, to the they default. They were saturated by, um, by tickets to the Microsoft support. Saturated. So they, they, the, the only reason why they removed the default is because they, were, they had too many customer uh, tickets open for a number of reasons. So they, they, by changing the default, they... They basically saved the, the, the customer support. Of course, we said, 
We told you. <laughs> Great. That's it. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. So, uh, I don't mean to. I'm just going to ask the question here. Visual level DAX expressions seem to be on the roadmap now. You can see yeah, where I'm. They are. What are the main use cases uh, where they really help? Report level measures. Uh, Report has level anyone measure. heard of visual level measures yet? So, the idea about creating visual level calculations is something that we supported publishing an article on SQL BI years ago. I don't years remember. Ago. I don't remember when. Too much time ago. And, um, and actually, it was already in a conversation with Microsoft, to be honest. But uh, making it public that there could have been this feature helped probably to get more votes and to increase the, 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 the prioritization of the feature. And now, they announced it. So they said, we are working on it. We are going to do that. So we, we are not disclosing any information now. We still don't know when it is ready, but they are working on it. And the idea is to make it simpler for an end user that doesn't have a good knowledge of DAX to compute a calculation applying, let's say, algebra on the numbers that you see on a visual. Let me try to describe this. Or, for example, I want to create a, give me the value of the previous row in this visualization and do a difference, regardless of what is the measure. So you don't have to know DAX, the data model, and all the other stuff. You just look at the numbers, and you say, I want to this minus that. That's it. Uh, for a calculation that works only for that page, that visual in that report, wonderful. But of course, that calculation will not be available to another user for another report for an so as long as you understand that the, the limitation clear the good uh, news in doing this in, in implementing this feature is that Microsoft is implementing new DAX functions that could be useful to other users and that would be very, very interesting because uh, once we have more functions in DAX, we can write another book. <laughs> <laughs> but no, besides, actually, we are waiting for that because it's the only big innovation we see in the future for DAX is visual calculation. Visual calculation. Yeah, and also from the performance point of view, if you think something about the running total, a running total is extremely heavy to compute at the model level because you need to place filters on the date or whatever column you are using, so the, it's a very heavy calculation. Whereas if you do a running total at the visual level, you just compute the sales amount for 100 rows, and then you do a running total over 100 rows, not over billions of rows that you might have in your data model. So are a lot of calculations where visual level calculations are actually good. They will, it depends on how they implement them and how visual they will be. If the experience is really click, 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 and uh, I build the calculation, that would be great. A lot of users will love them. And it will improve also the adoption, because a lot of uh, users are intimidated by DAX. Because the measure needs to be created at the model level. You need to know the model. You need to understand DAX. You need to understand a lot of concepts before you do something useful. Whereas with visual level calculation, you can start doing simple stuff uh, with visual level calculation, and then maybe over time uh, you evolve and you learn more about uh, the, the DAX language. Would a good example of visual level calculations that's what it's occurring in like tabular editor and like da, uh, Deneb custom visuals, where they can write, they're basically providing a data frame or a frame of data, and then in that visual they could pro write extra expressions that does other things, right? It could be formatting changes, it could be anything, but it's only local to that visual. Is that, is that kind of your thought, where, where this design's coming from? Because I was like, is, is, that, is that a good example of where visual level calculations are already being used today? Deneb and Charticulator. Or, and, or are you thinking about something different, maybe? Uh, well, there are other custom visuals that have a similar approach. For okay. example, the Inch Forever, has a, its own formula engine to, to do that. In the table, you can build yeah, like a yeah, whole yeah. table with formula, yeah. Um, 
And I think that the advantage of having this in the in the product is that you standardize the way you can define this calculation. Then, mm -hmm. in a very 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 far future, assuming that there is a way to control this feature in an external tool, you could actually generate measures using this feature. Mm -hmm. The Microsoft plan at the moment, I, I mean, what they disclose is that they want to create a user experience in Power BI where you have, uh, um, I don't know if it is a wizard or a, a formal environment, but basically you uh, have Power BI controlling the, the code generated. Mm -hmm. It's still Dask code, but it's not the Dask code that you would write uh, manually in a measure. But we, I mean, at the moment it is slideware. We don't have a real product to use, so I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but because we know that we will have this, I mean, at the end of the day, there will be Dax code. And if there is Dax code, it means that we can use Tabular Editor and write Dax code too. The only problem is how the single calculation in the single visual work and how it is defined at which level, in which part of the model, or it is just a report measure. Because, you know, a report measure is not visible through the Tabular Object Model, which means that it is invisible to uh, an external tool, for example. So. There are a few details that we don't know. And Makes sense. Good answer. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? We're also getting close on time, so I'll, I'll do a time check as well. It's getting later, 7.44. Yeah. Tommy, you want to do one more, one or two more questions left? Like and two, two, two more questions. Two more questions? Touch up with one question. Nice. Oh. All right. Is this a softball? Is this a, is this a hard one? Uh, no, no. It's, for, it's, it's for the marketing guy. <laughs> so Dan from uh, Milwaukee area. This is for the marketing guy sitting up there in Markworth, maybe, according to uh, Alberta's questions. Um, Bravo. Yeah. Um, mentioned earlier about, hey, it would be nice to be able to look at a data model and say if it's a good model or a bad model, color the tables, that kind of stuff. Um, I think Bravo is a great tool, especially for a lot of those self-service people growing in their skill set as opposed to the expert guy coming down. Um, what else do you see coming in Bravo? What would you uh, encourage the open source community to help contribute in? Where's Bravo going? Those types of things, right? Can it help us do things? Do you see it going into the visual layer ever, or is it just in the Tom side? So, so sorry, can you repeat this part? Do you see it going into the visual layer of the PBX files? Uh, For instance, right now you can say, this measure isn't used by anything else, you can get rid of it but you don't say this measure or these columns aren't used in any visuals, so here are the columns you can get rid of because, you know, like Imkey's oh, probably cleaner, those types of tools are <clears> out there. I know, I know. You see it going that direction. Um, so there are, uh, so Bravo is a tool we invested a lot to create, and what you see is uh, probably the third release. The first two were not good enough. Um, which means that we worked on it for, for a while. And because we wanted, also for other reasons, that I cannot mention now, but we wanted to find a, an architecture that will have allowed us to work with the, with the, with the Power BI ecosystem in a, in, a, in a good way, also with a good UI. So that was the, the reason why we were able to invest a lot, because otherwise you say, Marco, why did you create a free tool like that? Free. So, okay, that's a good question too, but technically it's open source and everybody can contribute. Actually, we had the contribution of many people for the in localized version. Bravo has, uh, is available in many languages. I don't remember, but certainly more than 10. Uh, we, the last one is Ukrainian. We have Ukrainian language too. Uh, we also have Russian, by the way, but we have many other languages, so we don't have any political restriction about the, the, the languages that that because actually it's open to the community. So if you, if we receive uh, someone that translate uh, in a language, we just host it. I think we also have Japanese. Yeah, we have I Japanese. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, but we, I would be surprised to receive a contribution for a new feature in C sharp using everything, because uh, the number of people in the Power BI world ecosystem that write code and no DAX and also have time to contribute to open source, open source project is so small, I, yeah, one hand is enough. So, <laughs> so,
So that is the problem. So we, we, we currently, uh, I'm realistic. I could say, oh, yes, we, we, we welcome any contribution, but I know that is, I would be surprised to see some good contribution. So what could happen is that we, a SQL BI, or other companies fund the project, uh, so pay someone that work on the project, and so at that point it's easier to find, it is not easy, but it's easier to find someone who can spend time on a project like that, and there are many things that we could do, of course. So we, uh, I, I, personally, I would like to have a lot of features. And what you mentioned, in part is technically possible, because there is already a tool that, do, that does this, which is the tool created by Matthias, I uh, don't remember the, the last name. I don't remember no. the last name. Uh, so PBI Tools. PBI Tools no. is oh, yeah. an open source tool that already has the- Matthias Zierbach, yeah. Matthias Zierbach, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and we already talked about that, and of course, it's, uh, they're, 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 I, mean, I, I hope that we will be able to solve that problem, which still doesn't solve another problem, which is uh, what if you publish another report that consumes that? I know, but it's you know, better than nothing. Right? So if you can investigate the visual layer of your model, it's already enough. And for many users, it's, it's enough, so why not? Uh, so improvement of the existing features, of course, is possible. New features is also possible. Um, one, one thing is what we discussed before about the, 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 the calculation groups, the patterns. It would be nice. We, we were discussing before the, 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 the chat, the, the public chat. We were discussing with Mike Carlo, how can we work together? Uh, Mike has uh, another tool. Uh, that generates tax code and using another system. So there, there are pro probably things we can do together, right? But, um, but I, I think that the problem is that it, it, what, the, what does it make sense to, to do in terms of investment for an open source tool that's free? So you only can get advertising indirect advertising. If you sponsor the project, you can have some visibility, but that's, that's it. So I, I, I don't see a, a big uh, line of companies that want to support uh, this. And, and, and by the way, once we have that, we still have the shortage of developers. There are not many people that can work on a project like that. Um, you need a lot of knowledge about many, many things. So we see. Uh, we, we certainly did something that we want to support and maintain, so I don't expect to see new features, big features soon, because just what we did is a lot. Uh, we'll see. Yeah. But you probably just like us, select things you would like to. We all have the, that feeling for sure. Like, oh. You, I'm sure you have a long list of things that you wish. I can list the oh, list of the list. features I would like. <laughs> Uh, it's too long. <laughs> I would like to have a good diagram view. It's color coded. It's color coded tables, facts, and dimensions. Comments, layers, groups. How many diagram view did Microsoft create already? I don't know, but they are. But a good. lot. I mean, we have seen something like three, four different yeah. versions of the diagram. Oh, sorry, view. I forgot the most important is fast. I want a diagram that is fast. Yes. If I have to, have to wait to move from one part to another, mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes I would like to print it, which is a problem. I don't have to print something today. We are in 2022. I have a 30 inches monitor. It should be fast. Mm. So, mm -hmm. And it is possible. And uh, maybe one day, I don't know. <laughs> Hello, I'm Priya Hello. from Chicago. Um, so when, when working with, uh, with, with tables, um, different fact tables coming from different sources, how do you avoid weighing a model down? How do you avoid? How do you avoid weighing a model down when working with fact tables from different sources? What is the problem? 
Um, I've noticed that when I'm working with different fact tables that come from different sources, when I try to merge them within Power BI, they tend to be uh, quite intensive, especially when they're quite big. And so how would I go about avoiding okay. that? Okay, so you are so you are importing different fact tables from different models. Yes. And then you are combining them using Power Query. Yes. And Power Query phase. Yes. Ah. <laughs> 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 you need a data warehouse. <laughs> I'll say it for you. Uh, need the data. Yeah. So yeah, it's uh, it's uh, yeah. I mean, Power Query is a great product. I like it, but when you have to use the internal engine of Power Query to do the transformation, you have to deal with the resources that it requires to do the transformation in memory. Um, when you can transform the, the, <clears throat> the request on a, on a single request of your data source, it's fast. When it, you have to work in memory, as you mentioned, you, you get two tables on two different data sources, you do a merge for whatever reason. Yeah, what happens is that you have to combine those two elements together in the engine of Power Query, which is in memory, which is in C Sharp, which is in dot, yeah, in dot .NET, so uh, it doesn't have a good virtualization of the memory used for the transformation, and out of memory is a, a common problem. And when you don't get out, you, you don't go out of memory, you still have to wait a lot of time. I know. Unfortunately, the solution is to use other tools unless they improve that part of our query. But as far as I know, at the moment, you can either move the data into a relational database and then do a query in SQL, or move the data into a data lake and then use a, one of the engines that you have for the data lake, or something like that. Um, this, is the, this, is, this is a really good example of, uh, Seth, can you go grab the hat? That's from the Maximum Roaches. So Matthew Roach is a, a product team member, and he has a Maxim that he uses transform the data as far upstream as possible and as far downstream as necessary. That's give, you know, she gets the hat. So, so yeah. this, is, this is Matthew Roach's maxim. And so like when we see problems like this, this is typically an indication of when Power Query just falls over, we're looking at like maybe use, again, trying to bring those data transformations up further stream away from Power Query itself um, in the tabular model or in the, in the PBIX file. Uh, options could be maybe data flows in PowerBI.com because then you can build tables beforehand that do transformations in a not all at once in the memory of the model. You can build them beforehand and then bring them into the model later on. Or if you have a lake house or the data engine or other oh. things upstream, do the merging outside of Power BI altogether. That's where uh, things like Azure Data Factory would be a good yeah. thing. Oh, another, yep, Azure Data Factory one too. By the way, I didn't try, but. I, I, I don't know Azure Data Factory, but I, um, I, I have seen that you can have the M query in Azure Data Factory transform into an internal uh, uh, query. So they basically, they don't use the, the, uh, the Power Query engine to apply the transformation when you use the Azure Data Factory. Is this yeah. correct? Yeah, there are, there are some limitations, ah, okay. but yeah, yeah. Cool. I mean, you could definitely work your way in that direction. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's an area where I don't have experience, but yeah, I should, I should find the time. Uh, let's just do one more question, I know, and then. Last okay. question. Last the, question. Last question. That better be a good one. Uh -oh. Hi. My name is Shahid, and I'm from Milwaukee. And I'm, uh, I'm a consultant, uh, and we provide services. Speak a bit louder. I don't hear you. Oh, you can't? This is, this is just for the online. Yeah. All right, sorry. OK. So my name is Shahid. I am from Milwaukee. Uh, and we provide services with Power BI and Azure. Uh, so my question is that with one of our clients, uh, I was working on a KPI project like where you provide one, one, in one, one UI and you have to show all the different KPIs like in a matrix or baller uh, dashboard. So in that dashboard, what we were challenging is that client wanted to see all the KPIs within the same interface you know, like different areas, KPIs, like performance or what I say, in what I said, like sales and, you know, services all in one place, like one dashboard and everything. 
So for that, uh, we use some kind of DAX measures, and we used one of the key uh, thing there is like switch statements. So switching between the different measures and having the complicated calculations. It was very good, successful, but we had some challenges like running into performance. So when we have a, this big giant of code, you know, in one place, so it's hard to tackle with the performance at what's hitting, like what measure is not working properly. So I want to just, uh, you know, discuss this scenario with you and wanted to know your exper experience and expertise here. Like what are the core, you know, thoughts we should put into before, you know, designing something like that? So, I try to rephrase the question. So you 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 are asking what what is the let's say the best approach when we have to provide a model where the selection of the KPI and the calculation related to the KPI must be driven dynamically into different paths of execution depending on the condition that you verify with selector slicers or other especially when you know when it, it goes big how do you control like where like how do you can control the performance and easily troubleshoot like yeah what which, what thoughts that's should be put? a good question so i i think that let me try to so today mm -hmm. it's a problem okay. it would be so one when i talk about the calculation groups if in a, in a better implementation of calculation groups, especially for the performance in a number of situations, calculation groups will be an elegant solution to split the code into different chunks that can be reused. Mm -hmm. Another feature that will be helpful is functions. If we had functions index plus calculation groups, that would be uh, very good. To, to help the engine to generate an efficient execution path. I'm not saying that it is easy, I'm saying that it would be, it would help. And I don't know what, how much Microsoft would, priori would prioritize that. With what we have today, when the model grows, we have to face a number of challenges, which is, uh, first of all, how can we make sure that the new measure or the change that you are applying today is not going to break everything, or even just one report. Uh, once you are after that, how can we guarantee that the improvement is actually a real improvement? The development work, I'm a developer. Originally, I am a developer, and I moved to the data, database world and then the business intelligence after I spend some time writing code. In the development world, this is a solved problem. We have what is called DevOps, right? So basically we have a number of tools, methodologies, and many other things that help us doing that. But first of all, there is a process. The process is you don't write the code and ship it. You write the code, test it, you test it again, then you create the unit test so that you can reproduce the test automatically later, so you will not waste your time trying the impossible thing. And then you continue to deploy this code in production so that a small change goes in production, if something goes wrong, we have a version control system, we can roll back to the previous version, and then in the meantime we fix it. I mean, the work runs over these principles, the database world, sorry, the business intelligence world does not today. I see a movement of people saying, guys, we should do something. This is not happening in the Microsoft world, or it is happening in a very limited way. I can tell you how many people are working on it, and again, then the maybe two hands is enough. But there is a movement. If you look for data ops instead of DevOps, you look for data ops. Data ops is there is a manifesto. 
that says what are the principles of data ops. But a simple way to say that, DevOps or data. So if we want to imagine whatever you can imagine, DevOps or data, apply to Power BI, we don't have anything. We are in a world where the best tools that exist are third party tools, most of them created with undocumented features. So when I say there is, there is nothing, I'm saying that there is not even a far idea of supporting someone that will do something for that. So the tools that exist, exist despite the lack of support for that kind of approach. And this will change. Not because I know that Microsoft is working on it, but because uh, luckily this will become a trend. And when it becomes a buzzword, oh, everybody has to do something for the buzzword, and finally we will have something that is useful, even though it is a buzzword. Maybe not everything that will be built on top of this buzzword will be really well done, but we will have something. And I think that we will, this, this could be a trend for the next few years. And if I will put some money on that, some investment, I will look at that area. But today, we don't have much. So. But we are at the beginning, so it, could, it can only improve. Look at the positive side. It can only improve. Thank you. Well, with that, um, guys, thank you so much for coming. We are so happy to have in person again. So we'll probably be meeting in December at some point. So just go, make sure to join the meetup page. That's the best way to find out the information. So make sure you're part of the subscriber list so you know what's going on. Um, thanks for those who joined online as well. I just want to give a huge thank you to Alberto and Marco. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for hosting. Absolutely enjoyed this, guys. So thank you so much. And again, have a safe trip back. And see you later. So. Say ciao. Thank you. Ciao, friends. Thank you. Enjoy ducks. Enjoy ducks. Enjoy ducks. <laughs>